everybody. Um, lovely to be here today. So um, I'm gonna. I'm, my name is Paul Skinner. I'm a creative director at Telart. Um, uh, I'm sorry. I'm trying to figure out where the sound is coming from, but it's come from that. That's pretty loud. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm here to talk about tools we can't grasp and uh, what that means to us. Um, it's kind of interesting to think about tools for us um, because we work with uh, so many different kinds of technologies. So it's given me a chance to think through some, some ideas and there's some wet paint, so bear with me a little bit. Um, we're an international design studio. Um, uh, and we, we say we design culturally meaningful and resonant experiences with emerging technologies. Um, this is like, uh, it's, we've been around for about 18 years and we're about 40 people around the world now. Uh, it's a really fun place to work. I love it very much. Um, and for us, uh, we tell a lot of stories and we do a lot of inventing and we immerse people in these things. Um, this is, uh, these are the three components for the kinds of stuff that we do. Um, but we are, uh, industrial designers, and we are information designers, and we're interaction designers, and we are experience designers, um, and that kind of breadth of that 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 also those th those four things on stage there also sh tell a story of how the company has evolved over time, um, as it's as it's learned and grown uh, with the different people that have joined. We tend to do a lot of work as well um, with this kind of innovation uh, practice that exists in a lot of big companies these days. Uh, this is the Three Horizons. Oh, I hope that's not my... No, it's not. That's all right. I was thinking my computer had crashed. <laughs> this is the Three Horizons model um, that is uh, used by McKinsey and so on to help companies innovate. And it shows you the different stages that they should be thinking at if they want to move past where they are today. And we often do a lot of work at the intersection of Horizon 2 and 3 out there, which are on the, the edge of what's possible. Um, but unfortunately, you don't see that on our website because a lot of that stuff is hidden um, because it's secret and the companies don't want to uh, share it because it's really early R&D stuff. Um, but we also do a whole bunch of museum exhibition pieces which are about informal learning and we do a lot of experiential marketing stuff which is the kind of stuff that you're more likely to see on our website. Um, all of the stuff that we do um, pivots around this uh, idea of human-centered design, design for the human. We spend a lot of time um, researching and understanding uh, human needs and creating solutions for these needs. Um, and, it's, and it's something that persists. It's interesting to think about this, the, the theme of this conference because we recognized very early that the, um, the, the way that physical forms and digital forms are, are shaped and designed and produced was changing. And so moving from an industrial design training into something which integrates technology in a very uh, real sense um, was a very important part of, of the work that we do. And so just as um, the architect Sarinen uh, proposed that you should always design for your next biggest context, we have to consider these days that our next biggest context is, as Ruri just showed us, um, a very different world where suddenly everything is a computer, and not just a computer, but a, a computer capable of interpreting the world around it. Um, everything is interconnected and intelligent. And it means uh, very different things for us. Um, power structures are invisible, and power structures are chaotic. Our economy has become algorithmic. Um, it's far more volatile. And machinic systems uh, around us dictate our daily behaviors and influence our political positions all the time. It feels like we're passing through an inflection point, um, a point that's going to change our society kind of one way or the other going into the future, um, from something uh, that's kind of predictable and known and we all understand, at least for me, maybe, you know, like if you were born in the 90s or in the year 2000s, then it's different for you already, but um, it feels much less predictable. And this kind of sense of discomfort is brought about by the, uh, the speed at which we're adopting all of these new technologies and the way that the world's changing. It, we're, we're facing an increasing pace of change. This is the rate of technology ad adoption by households across the United States. You can see the increased angle there as these new things like the tablet, although it took decades for things like the microwave to take hold. I still don't have a microwave. Um, it seems very strange, and we like this idea of the strange presence, something that feels uncomfortable, transient, and ephemeral, um, because it gives us a new space in which to operate. It, it means that we have to take a very active role in shaping things. And there's this idea that we've been um, talking about for a while now, um, that came from William Gibson, in which his character in this book, Pattern Recognition, says that 
our future has insufficient now to stand on now. And that means that he's saying that like, it's very, very difficult to imagine a future in this situation in which everything is so volatile and everything's moving so quickly. Um, it's very, very chaotic and therefore we can't figure out what's next. We just don't know where to look. We're kind of in a fuzz. Um, this is a diagram which uh, I was introduced to by one of our clients, Noah Rayford. Um, and it shows how um, this, uh, this sense of chaos and this increased speed of change um, is really brought about by all of the uh, structures, the government models, the economic models, physical infrastructure, and the social agreements that we have in place with each other are kind of breaking down. This is the 20th century kind of uh, disintegrating as the 21st century is born. And we have new economic models like the circular economy and so on, new financial currencies that are based on cryptocurrencies and blockchain, which haven't fully caught on yet, but are heading in that direction, and new models of trust, which we haven't yet established between ourselves. We have this uh, crazy period in between these two, which are going to be um, chaos, and it's going to be uh, conflict, because we have to transition from one way of thinking to this other radically different way of thinking, and it could take multiple decades to get there. We're going to have people like... Uh, coming in being the champion of the past, like Donald Trump, who's saying we can make America exactly what it was before. And then we've also got people like you guys, who are like on the fringes, uh, doing like biohacking experiments and breaking things uh, to make new kind of ways of, ways of existing. So if it's, uh, if it's, he says, which I really love, he's like, it's our jobs to facilitate this change, to help move from one to the other. We have to, we have to make that happen. It's gonna be our lifetimes and our careers if it's the next 30 years making this happen, which I, I'm really excited about. So how do we do that? Um, I mean, it's not, it's not easy, uh, sorry, it's not difficult to uh, imagine that like, it's, uh, it's gonna be full of conflict. It's, uh, there, th there are all of these kind of ex existential risks, and even the people who are kind of painted as our saviors technologically don't have answers. You know, This is Elon Musk um, saying that he's no idea what he's gonna do, although he seems to have plenty of ideas. Um, so how can we design in this state of complexity and flux? And this led us to this project that we started doing in Dubai um, when we were approached by the aforementioned Noah Rayford, who is a, um, a con was a consultant in the UAE uh, government. And it's interesting to consider how uh, he was operating in Dubai, because Dubai, of course, is a very young country, and 40 years ago it looked like this, and now it looks like this. It's in a place of incredible speed of change. Um, and this happened in a, in a couple of generations. And his challenge to us was, let's create a, uh, a vision for what the future might be like and how we can get people excited toward making that change in a positive and optimistic sense. And so for the past four or five years, we've been working on projects like this with him, um, which is the Museum of the Future. Um, the Museum of the Future is a fully kind of immersive, uh, spatial, interactive experience which storytells these uh, moments in the future um, to create these prototypes and uh, scenarios that people can walk through. It's held at, the, at this really, really key thing for them, which is the, the World Government Summit, where all of this government people come together and talk about how they're gonna get through with policies and initiatives and where they should spend their money. And so as a, as a designer looking to create impact, it's really exciting for me to be able to talk to those people so directly because this is how things change actually happens. And so as I said, um, we're looking to create high fidelity prototypes um, and we need to be plausible. We need to, do some, we, need to, we need to prototype something that could make things better, but it's also credible coming from uh, His Highness and um, the, uh, the Prime Minister's office, we're not just inventing stuff here, we have to actually make it real. And so we include a huge process of ethnography and foresight experts and non-experts from various backgrounds um, to get a very broad reach for what kinds of things we might be looking at if we're trying to invent what the future looks like. And so I'm gonna jump into um, the kinds of things that we've come up with in the past to uh, to manifest these experiences. So we looked, for example, at things like healthcare. Um, oh, do I have sound? That's not me. <laughs> um, so in this future, we described this bathroom in which your healthcare changes from something which is uh, responsive and reactive to when you have an illness to something which is pr uh, preventative. 
and it alerts you in the, in, the, in the comfort of your own home of the things that might be going on with your body by tracking um, your, you know, your Fitbit, by knowing how many uh, hours you've slept in your bed, by knowing how many calories you're consuming in your, in your um, meal times. And then each one of these mirrors is a kind of like a bathroom mirror, which we're proposing that a doctor would live in, an algorithmic doctor, which is diagnosing you um, before anything's actually gone wrong and giving you ways to tweak your lifestyle. Or these kinds of um, uh, immersive games that we created. Because it, uh, obesity is one of the biggest problems in the UAE. And so by, um, by focusing on that culture and figuring out how to, in how to implement new forms of um, diagnosis, we uh, propose that the future might involve gaming as a source of uh, healthcare. So everyone hangs around in shopping malls in the UAE because it's very, very hot. How could we measure things like uh, from biometrics, like heart rate, blood pressure, and so on, test your range of motion and your hand-eye coordination to make diagnosis before something's going wrong? And then moving into, um, moving into uh, uh, like treatment, how could we imagine like a modern apothecary where synthetically engineered plants could actually provide you medicine to treat you with for your ailments through tonics and healing elixirs in a way which feels hospitable like a hotel in the very finest hotels in the in Dubai and so on. Uh, we also, oh this is the video actually playing now. So we worked with um, Bompas and Pa who are like an experimental um, uh, sound and taste experience, uh, sorry, uh, taste and smell experience in London to create these uh, custom elixirs which people could actually ingest. It's really, really interesting as, an, as, a, as a company that's working with uh, projection mapping, interactive technologies, like a lot of you are, to be working with steam that smells of ginger and, and so on, and then having royalty come and inhale it because the security guards really care about that. I want to make sure that you're not doing anything nasty. Um, but we weren't, and it was really interesting to see how people were responding to these things. We also looked directly at how emerging technologies affect human agencies. So we were talking about um, this, this decreasing gradient of human agency as uh, things like micro-robotics and machine learning take hold of our lives in very direct ways. This is a, a silicon future in which um, ar artificial intelligence and predictive algorithms uh, are involved in our lives, and the human body becomes something which is mediated, mechanized, and networked. And so we, we created this whole space that was like a, something like a cross between um, an Apple store and a medical clinic of sorts, um, and we called it the Augmentation Spa. And the Augmentation Spa was um, a place where you could go to try on these bodily augmentations that are available for your purchase. And so we created a set of speculative um, products that we had designed based on all of the research that we had done that might be available to you in this future um, to replace your knees or to give you ex uh, extraordinary um, senses. And we allowed you to try them on by using augmented reality or virtual reality experiences before, excuse me, before uh, you had to have them surgically implanted into your body. Because of course people kind of thought that you could buy them, so they also thought that you could also have them surgically implanted. But all of this stuff is speculative. So to create the sense of deep immersion, we built things like this, which are, are you um, bored at work? speculative are adverts. Are you sick of watching the action from afar? Introducing iShare by Do. iShare is the newest social network for distributed sensation. It gives you the ability to broadcast exactly what you are seeing to your friends or colleagues or you can tune right into the eyes and ears of others. With iShare, you can see through others' eyes. Tune into the iStream today for a new view on life. By using the iShare network, you grant iShare Incorporated full rights and a million license to all transmitted images and sensation. <laughs> or new knees, which what is enough. What makes you feel alive? Exploring the farthest reaches of the globe? Pushing the limits of what is possible? Keeping up with or even wearing out your grandkids? New Knees is the new skeletal muscular implant that gives you the ability to perform extraordinary physical feats. Run at incredible speeds, leap tall buildings, and lift heavy loads. Discover new challenges and enrich your life with New Knees. One small step for you, one giant leap for your quality of life. 
Mm. So it's a very it's a very tongue in cheek treatment to uh, how these things might manifest. But if you imagine walking into a space which is fully kitted out like a shop, like the Apple Store, it's amazing how uh, persuasive that can be. The space design and the way that it's put together makes you feel like you're actually going to a shop, and that was really important for us. Another thing we looked at was governance. Um, working for the government, we were presenting to a bunch of ministers, and so we wanted to present to them how the nature of their work might change, and the idea that it might become something which is in, like uh, driven by machine learning and something that becomes ambient, uh, ethically able, and algorithmic in its decision uh, making means that we're allowing it to, m to emerge its own behaviors. Like we, we hand over um, agency to this, th this, uh, this machine tool and tell it that it can run our lives. And so to create this, we made this crazy space, which is kind of like um, X-Men style, uh, but it, it was like, you know, like it was like magic. People walked into this space, into this um, data processing facility, which showed these millions of data points swirling on its surface as it analyzed the daily ins and outs of everybody in the cities and, uh, and roads of, um, of the UAE and tried to figure out what decisions it should take about various things. So it was looking at, um, it was looking at the kinds of surgeries that were taking place, um, the kinds of uh, traffic signals that were being operated. Um, the idea is that it's, it's deciding most of this stuff um, on our behalf, but the, the, um, the ministers who are there get to help it make decisions which it's unable to make. And so we created this uh, set of panels which, uh, in a very kind of um, nuanced way, they kind of ask these oblique questions to help um, ethically help it decide which way it should go. And um, it was kind of, it was really interesting how people uh, responded to this because they were actually very, very comfortable with the idea of uh, giving over agency to a machine to make a lot of their decisions, um, until the point where this thing actually gave you a job interview. And then it was basically telling you what job it thought you should do in your life. And then it, it sort of flung it back on the person and made them realize that actually they ceased to be in control of their own life, and they didn't like that so much. Um, we took that uh, idea to uh, the World Economic Forum in Davos, which is uh, obviously Dubai feels like a, a separate place. It feels like the Middle East is like, you know, there's, it's a very different kind of political establishment to what we have here in Europe. And so bringing it to Europe made us um, much more conscious about how we are positioning this to um, the rest of the world in that they were, uh, mu in, but even then, they were much more willing to engage with the kind of the idea of a moral machine um, making decisions on your behalf and you helping to tune its decision or tend the garden as we like to describe. And this is in line, if you look online, just a couple of days ago, I think they released, um, or I saw at least, the, uh, the results from a big MIT experiment which is very similar to this, which is a huge online survey helping um, uh, machine intelligences make moral decisions and this is related to the trolley problem which you might know about, which is whether uh, self-driving cars drive over a dog or a granny or a person who ran out in front of the road and so on, like ethical decisions which they might be forced to make if the brakes failed and so on. It's really interesting to think how humans might have a, li how a, have a role to play in these futures. And so um, these, kind of, uh, these kind of interactive experiences that we've created rely very heavily on this idea of making stuff real, tangible, and visceral. And um, as experience designers, um, we have to prototype a lot with our technology. Prototyping is how we learn how to make things, it's how we invent things, but it's also how we decide what the content should be. So by prototyping, we're really able to get a better handle on how audiences respond to things and how uh, things tell stories as we hope they're gonna tell. There's younger me. Um, and this is, uh, this is a big part of what we do, but then we also wanna make it physical, and this is something that I hold very dear to my heart, is because, as Ruri said just now, a physical, a real physical interaction has a lot of value as it feels like we're actually in it. We feel, we feel I, can t I can hit my hand on this and I feel like I'm actually having this experience. Whereas if I'm just doing everything on screens or in a virtual world or worse still on PowerPoint, then I just don't feel engaged at all. And so this creating this sort of suspension of disbelief in a real world is something that we feel very strongly about. And finally, visceral, visceral means creating an emotional response. And so this is a really big part of it for us. 
Um, we want to have people respond in a very emotional way because it's how they make decisions. Um, and the idea of creating this kind of, uh, these, these uh, treading this difficult boundary between seductive ideas and repulsive ideas is really, really important in a lot of speculative design because it really helps pl like pull apart the threads of each concept and figure out what you are comfortable and what you're not comfortable. Um, and then, like, do I want this in my life or do I want this for my kids? Um, would I put my kids in a self-driving car and have them taken to school by themselves? You know, that's a very different question to would I be in a self-driving car because I feel, I feel very strongly about protecting my child. And then also, it's interesting to think about more generally when you create these kinds of um, visions of the future, it creates either a sense of, you know, along, along with seductive and repulsive, hope and fear, like we want to actually um, have people aspire to a better future and help, help people realize that they, they actually have a role to play in shaping that future. And so we want to make sure that what we're creating is this kind of skeptical optimism where people feel like a little uncomfortable with the ideas we're putting forward, but they feel hopeful that, that like what we are prototyping here and making real for them is a step towards a better future, which we feel um, really excited about. Um, and ultimately, it's about storytelling. Um, futures and the, the transfer of ideas through futures is about helping people imagine further. And so if we are all able to imagine a better future, it's much more likely to be something that might manifest. If we all believe that the next, if we all believe that we're gonna go to Mars, then suddenly the world is probably gonna go to Mars. It's not because we're um, falsely believing it, it's because it's something that we all aspire to together. And so there becomes, the economy gears itself towards that. Governments align themselves with it. And so this idea of collective imagination as a force that transforms society or indeed a brand or an organization of any size is very, very exciting for us. Um, and it's something that uh, you, th you have to think about in today's context, going back to ex uh, existential threats. You know, of course, uh, we're not in a, um, in a bubble here, like climate change is something which is gonna be a big force in all of this. And we've, we've kind of um, passed now uh, a very, very scary uh, threshold and we're passing new scary thresholds all the time, as I understand it. Um, and it feels like we need to galvanize our own actions towards something which is actually much more serious. It's about avoiding extinction. And this is something that Buckminster Fuller said a long time ago, um, that our task is predominantly metaphysical because it's about educating humanity to generate a spontaneous social change um, in order to avoid extinction. And so our latest uh, exhibition in Dubai was about that, which is kind of ironic because we couldn't probably do that in the US given that Trump had already ascended to power, but we um, proposed a, an alternate future, um, accepting that climate change might have already happened. So I'll just let this play for a little bit. We started this with a kind of crazy journey into climate change has happened. <laughs> Can you turn it up a bit, please? So this is a world in which climate change has already happened and the, the, um, the country of the UAE has figured out how to combine uh, the genetics of a jellyfish with that of a mangrove root in order to purify water and it's brought this to the rest of the world on an industrial scale. And this, is an, this is an idea of flipping, um, flipping the threat of climate change onto its head and making people feel like actually it's a huge economic opportunity was very, very powerful because all of a sudden people got excited that the technologies that they already have in the country could be really useful um, in an in a environment in which um, there was a lot of danger. We, we worked very closely with um, bio, uh, evolutionary biologists and, um <coughs> excuse me, getting a bit ill and urban planners to figure out how we could bring um, farming to a local level and how we 
create a regenerative economy that was based on distribution of um, manufacture and local products and so on, only producing as much food as is necessary um, in your building, even vertical farming, all of this stuff. Um, how we could create cities which were actually automated. The deployment of a city was able to, was, was, is something that could be moved. So rather than having a city being permanently located, we'd be able to go back towards what the, um, the natives of the UAE used to do, which is roam around to where the resources were, and how we could actually have um, cities which recreated cultural artifacts from years gone by in this way. Um, this was a really exciting project for us because it was, it, it was, it was, uh, people responded to it really, really well. And the idea of, as I said, like uh, presenting um, a, like the reality of climate change and the kinds of stuff that would need to happen for us to actually survive in a, a post-climate change world in a place which is a very, very con consumptive place. It's full of oil and it's full of money and it's full of big malls, but people actually were very responsive to this. Um, and we were very inspired by this chap, Daniel Wall, who was a, who's a, um, a biologist who's an expert in biomimicry that we worked with. And he was telling us basically that we have to learn, if we're going to do stuff like this, we have to learn to design as nature. Um, we have to learn to figure out that actually humans aren't just, uh, technology and humans are not a separate thing from nature. We're not designing in a bubble, in a vacuum. Uh, and we're not designing purely for ourselves. We're designing as part of a huge machine. We are participants of natural processes, and we're an expression of natural processes, um, which aligns very strongly with the sort of thing that um, is being presented or was being presented about 10 minutes ago in the other room with Next Nature, who um, very strongly identify technology as something which will become nature if it's not already become nature. Um, this, is, this is a really uh, thick idea for us to get our heads around. Another quote uh, from James Bridle, who's thinking about technology and the way that it's changing our society, um, he argues for systemic lit literacy. So the idea that um, the world that we live in is already uh, created, but the behaviors that exist in this world are already created by technology that we've adopted into our lives and have already um, ceased to be in control of. If you look at stock exchange markets, um, something like 99.9% .9 of transactions on stock exchange markets are already uh, automated and no one's in control of them and no one really knows how it all works anymore. Um, we're, we're already in that world. <coughs> and so he's saying that basically um, uh, the idea of systemic literacy is not that you have to understand everything, it's that you have to be able to read everything and figure out how these uh, complex systems are affecting different uh, factors um, and that we need to play a role in this. We are part of this network. It's not something which is computable. We have to allow for emergence and be comfortable with the idea that we're designing in this world now of, of, of continual flux and, um, and complexity. And for us, what we've discovered is that futures, exploring futures is one way of doing that. Um, but we have to uh, move away from these sci-fi futures which paint a very singular, compelling vision of what the future might be like. Um, this is, um, I forgot to credit this, but this is, of course, uh, uh, 2049 the um, new Blade Runner. Blade Runner, thank you, <laughs> which I love. But like the idea here is that we're moving from future to future. So this, this is about um, towards going, like I, uh, identifying that there are many, many futures that might happen. There are many, many presents that are happening around us right now. And these things can exist together alongside each other. It's a heterogeneous futures that we're heading towards and that the, the um, interactive experiences that we painted in these exhibitions are examples of the many different futures that might exist in your lives or people who are living in Australia or in India. That we have to figure out how to, how to define what those futures might be in order to steer us towards them. And we worked with a bunch of futurists to make these things happen. And the prevailing attitude amongst futurists is that you can't predict the future, but you can invent them. Um, and this can happen in a number of ways. We, uh, th there's, a, there's a huge deep history of futures and how futures are invented, which we uncovered and we really didn't know much about in the past, but um, it's a formalized corporate practice at a place like Shell, um, which was developed in the late 60s and 70s. And all of these tools exist to help you either um, deduce what the future is gonna be given a set of, um, of uh, critical uncertainties or induce them. And um, of course, right now we are in a moment where we really need new tools to help us 
navigate this complexity that we find ourselves in. And so this, is, for us, has been a really, really fruitful journey. Um, to give you an example of how an inductive process works, in induction rather than deduction means that we're taking a set of uh, specific observances and then bringing them together in a way that generates a creative uh, response to them. So we're not saying that like categorically that something happens as a result of, of these things. Rather, we're saying this is a really interesting thing that might happen if you look at those. And this is this, this described over here, that we analyzed a whole bunch of trends and drivers that fell into categories like social, technological, environmental, economic, and political. This steep framework, which is really helpful because it broadens away from technology and forces you to look at the rest of the world. And we grouped them together in ways that we felt as a group of like um, workshop participants, which is up to sort of 40 people of really different backgrounds, thought that might be really compelling. And then we invented a bunch of new products and services, some of which I mentioned, but um, most of which, I mean, we've done a lot of this stuff. And so this is not about prediction. It's, it's about developing this sense of systems literacy, like figuring out how we can get our heads around this complexity. Um, and we've, we've come to adopt this futures practice as a design tool of our own, um, which is really, really exciting for us because it applies in so many of the other places that we do business and that we are making uh, really exciting experiences. Um, this is, uh, yeah, so, so this, is, this is kind of like a big part of what we do now. <laughs> and this, this idea that you need to, or a really uh, great way of um, coming up with what the future might be like and how we can solve our problems in this complex world is very related to this thing that I read about craftsmanship um, and about tools. Because if we've adopted design futures as a design tool, how else does this apply to our tools? Um, this is something that I read in a book by uh, Richard Sennett about the craftsman. And he says that like tools, like traditional tools, like this screwdriver, um, like are really interesting because they you need a, a sort of sense of intuition to figure out how to break them. And this, I think, is what a lot of media artists and a lot of people who are working in digital technologies and stuff doing, are doing all the time. We're reappropriating uh, technologies for purposes that they're not meant for and so on through the sense of uh, intuition. And what he's saying here is that this really happens most when you're trying to make a repair because if you've, got, if you've made a thing and you want to repair it, but it's like it's happened unexpectedly, but you've only got the tools that are in your toolbox. You're like, well, what have I, how can I do this? What have I got here? So you're kind of, well, if I use this like this and I scratch this in this way, and it's that way that we intuitively discover a new way of using a tool. And so this is something that I'd like to, uh, for us to adopt a little bit more directly, and it relates very much to how we think about materials. Um, as industrial designers, it's interesting to think back to how craftsmen always were. Um, the, the idea that the craftsman can, oh, something's gone a bit screwy with this, but those words are supposed to be on the corners. The, the, <laughs> the idea that uh, a craftsman is supposed to embody um, an artist and a technician with a, uh, yeah, with the craftsperson um, is, is something which used to happen pre-industrial era because everyone was a craftsperson, like these guys, they were making stuff with their hands. But during the industrial era, it became very separated because the technologies like the weaving looms became so complicated that you needed technicians and you needed creative people to help design the things that were gonna be woven on the looms. But now, in this room, people like you and I are more like these craftspeople. We're able to, at once, consider the design of something we want to make and how we're going to make it. And this is how I learned um, how to make digital experiences because the, the information is at our fingertips. Um, and we like to consider um, that these, uh, this way of working is about working with materials just the same as it is for these guys, about wood and metal and so on. But these things are less knowable. Th this, is, this is the code that we're working with these days. Um, we don't really understand how to make use of them. There a lot of people are still not able to speak code. I mean, my mother doesn't understand code. My, there's a lot of people in the world that doesn't understand code. And if you look at the hype cycle, um, which is showing how emerging technologies are being uh, talked about, uh, there's a whole bunch of technologies here which haven't been fully explored in this way as tools or materials. And we consider it our job to think about those things. If you think about machine learning, it's still a black box. The idea that people uh, un like really understand how uh, a neural network works is not true at all. Like It's still very much a black box. And so we have to discover what it means to use machine learning in these various contexts and combining that with um, 
futures is really nice. Uh, here's There's a, a very important responsibility to provide Sorry about that. the rest of us with an imagination for this world that scientists haven't yet described. So this, sorry, it's a very short clip, but it's Kevin Slavin from the MIT lab talking about our responsibility as designers. Now, it's really interesting to think that our responsibility as designers is to uh, translate those materials into something that other people can use, because that means using metaphor a lot. And um, this creation of metaphor is something that's really important if we're able to make new tools and new materials from all of these emerging technologies into something which, uh, which is uh, ad adopted by everyone in their lives. Um, our design director, Christian Irvin, who's, um, who recently wrote a Core 77 article about uh, what a camera is and how our collective understanding of what a camera is is being reshaped by its integration into these new technologies. As an example, this is Google Clips, this is a camera, but it doesn't have a button. Well, it does have a button, but it doesn't have a button that you take pictures with. It takes pictures all the time for you. It decides what is a picture worth taking and what's a picture that's not worth taking. So a camera now has agency. Um, this is the Pinterest lens, which isn't playing either, but it should be playing. Oops. So this is, a, this is an app which allows you to search visibly, uh, visually by taking photographs of something. And it pr your, every, every pin that you add to your board is giving the machine a new way of linking things visually so that you don't have to search with tags and so on. You can search visually. And then going back to this uh, NVIDIA example of growing of GANs for improved quality, stability, and variation. This is, none of these things are photographed. This is like an interpolation of all of the photographs that this thing generated. None of them are real. So what does it mean um, for a camera? And is the metaphor of the camera um, really still valuable? And this is something that James Bridle said as well. Um, what is needed is not new technology, but new metaphors, a meta language for describing the world that complex systems have wrought. And so as designers and as creators of experience, um, and as uh, purveyors of technology in general, we sort of have um, a new job to do to exist in this transition decade, to move from one world to the next in this sense of complexity. We need to, one, figure out what kind of future we might want, and there's a whole bunch of tools at our disposal for doing that. We need to, two, understand that the technology itself is becoming a natural process and something which is emerging uh, new behaviors that we have to uh, acknowledge and we have to accept that we're, it's not fully within our control anymore and we have to understand the impact of ourselves in that world. But also we need to help uh, ourselves adopt these new terms and we have to invent new ways of understanding these things so we get that systems literacy. Um, because it's true that already the camera has become some kind of new species of camera and we need to teach people what that species might be like. And so in order to explore how all of these things work and what it means for us, uh, we decided to turn the question back on ourselves and explore the nature of a tool and present a speculative uh, design tool to the world which has been exhibited in the V&A. So just to wrap up, I'll, um, I'll let this video play out which explains uh, what the Terraform table is for us. The exhibition is called The Future Starts Here. It's a major exhibition here at the v &A, and we've brought together a hundred projects which are shaping the world of tomorrow. So we introduced the show with this terrific quote from Paul Rilio where he says, the invention of the ship was also the invention of the shipwreck. So contained within new ideas, new inventions, new objects are multiple futures, good and bad, and they're completely intertwined um, and they all happen at once. Uh, the sand table is situated within this section of the planet. Here we're looking at questions of climate change and even going beyond the Earth. So the aspirations of some people today to colonise Mars, for instance. The terraform table is made up of a depth sensing camera and a projector above a sandbox. This allows people to with their hands create different topographies, different hills and valleys, and the depth sensing then tells a computer and the projector what colors and patterns to project on the sand. When we first came across this combination 
of a depth sensing camera and a projector and a sandbox to make a three-dimensional tangible user interface was a project that was done around 2012 out at UC Davis. Since then, hundreds if not thousands of artists and designers have created iterations of this all over the world. Over the years, we've experimented with this combination of technologies. And now, this project that we're presenting is one where we've introduced artificial intelligence, or more specifically, machine learning, where we take thousands of satellite images from all over the world with corresponding high-resolution altitude data sets from those same places, and we feed them into a neural network which builds an intelligent color palette of the Earth. And we're taking this project, exhibiting it at several different places, working on a next iteration, and of course we intend to open source and publish about them back to the community. Each time we do an experiment like this, we're looking at emerging technologies and how that might change the performance characteristics capabilities, but we're maybe even more importantly focused on the cultural meaning of the work. And in this case, we are addressing the idea of terraforming other planets. Do humans have the right? Are they entitled to go to these pristine natural environments out in our solar system and take them over with their science and technology and transform them into places enough like Earth that they and other Earth life forms can live there. This goes beyond the conversation about whether it's technologically possible and presents a platform for reflection and debate about whether or not it's ethically responsible. So just in to highlight what Ruri was talking about earlier, um, we always have to thank all of the different partners and collaborators because these projects are enormous and I could talk for hours about all of the different parts of them, but we've learned a huge amount from those collaborators. So um, that's it. Thank you very much.